Hello everyone, my name is Dr Paul Rose and I'm particularly interested in zoo animal behaviour and welfare. I'm a zoo biologist and an animal behaviour scientist. I'm particularly associated with research into captive flamingo behaviour and welfare and I'm the co-chair of the IUCN Flamingo Specialist Group. Having this role in the IUCN means I am aware of the links between the zoo and the wild. Zoo housed animals are excellent ambassadors for those out in the field and for us as scientists they can help us answer many questions that otherwise might be really tricky. The flamingo for example is so commonly housed in zoos that the work we do with these captive birds has a wide impact across many populations. Zoos are excellent places for studying animal behaviour. You can get close up to species that would otherwise be difficult to study in the wild and consequently you can ask a range of questions that relate to natural history, biology and ecology by using zoo house populations. In this presentation we're going to look at how we measure and record key aspects of zoo animal behaviour that can tell us a lot about their lives in the zoo as well as more about their particular aspects of evolutionary history and natural history too. The modern zoo keeps its animals in expansive naturalistic exhibits that provide key features of the natural environment that the animal would normally engage with. These are Pear David's deer living in a large expansive paddock in a natural social structure. The Pear David's deer was, until fairly recently, extinct in the wild. Thanks to the work of zoos, this animal is now on its way to being successfully re-established. The natural social system you can see and the naturalistic environment provided has allowed scientists to study the ecology and behaviour of this species away from its native range states and gather information that has been super useful to conservation. But conservation action is not just for large enigmatic species. This is a Chinese water deer, a species that has become feral due to escapees from British zoos in the Victorian period. But this has a positive side because the Chinese water deer is classed as vulnerable and the British population now accounts for 10% of the global population of this species. Thanks to close encounters possible at Woburn Safari Park and at ZSL Whipsnade Zoo, scientists have gathered key information on the ecology of this species that can translate directly into the wild. And such efforts are also important for more traditional threatened species too. I love the sound of this chewing rhino. Getting up close to animals is what zoos are all about. And this is really helpful to the animal behavior scientist because this accessibility is brilliant for scientific study. Individuals with distinguishing features mean a focal follow is possible where you follow the behavior of a particular animal, noting exactly what it's doing. Focal scan sampling or continuous sampling allows you to get a record of that individual's behaviour over time. Both of these methods are useful for state behaviours which can then be popped into a time activity budget. In the case of these rhinos, horn size and shape is a really good example of distinguishing features that will allow you to follow particular individuals and record exactly what each one is doing. Focal follows are really important when we want to see how being in the zoo impacts on individual behaviour patterns. These giraffes, each one of them is individually identifiable by its coat patterns. Therefore, we could create a time activity budget for each specific animal in the group. These time activity budgets tell us how giraffes proportion up their energy and therefore the motivation for particular behaviours. Time, which is how we record behaviour, is equivalent to energy, which is equivalent to motivation. 
This therefore gives us an insight into animal welfare. The more motivated an animal is to perform that behaviour, the more it will want to perform that behaviour. And that is expressed as a moment of time, which we then record using our focal scan samples or our continuous sampling of each individual's time spent on behaviour in its activity budget. So if we were interested in the amount of time that each individual giraffe was interacting with these feeders, we could record that and then compare those times statistically between all members of the group. Individual focal follows are particularly relevant when we want to measure how animals interact with things that we have provided for them within their environment. For example, usage of environmental enrichment. In this case with these reindeer, a cut tree branch, otherwise known as browse, has been provided to extend foraging opportunities within the enclosure. We can measure individual interaction with the enrichment, and we can also measure behavioural diversity, the change to the number and time spent on behaviours performed by the individuals when they get enrichment. Therefore, by using focal recording techniques and directly measuring the amount of time spent interacting with the enrichment, as well as the time spent on the range of different behaviours performed, we can get an idea of how useful the enrichment is to the animals, how long they spend interacting with it, and therefore, how can we change or adapt the enrichment so it promotes more naturalistic behaviours? Such approaches work really well when animals have helpful markings, colours or patterns that allow us to tell them apart. But what if you've got a big group of animals that all look very similar? We still need to measure their behaviour we still need to check on their welfare state, and we still need to see how they're engaging with the environment in the zoo. So how do we measure the behaviour of a group that might all look the same? If you have a large group of animals together that you can't individually identify, then you need to use an instantaneous scan sample. Instantaneous scan sampling is where you count the number of individuals that you see performing your predefined and predetermined behaviours at specific time points. For example, if you are studying this mixed herd of deer every two minutes or every one minute or every five minutes per hour, you would count the number of individuals performing the particular behaviours from your ethogram on these one, two or five minute sample points. Instantaneous scan sampling gives you a nice indication of the average amount of time spent on behaviour by an individual within the group overall. Behaviour is averaged over the count of all individuals within the group. Creation of time activity budgets, be that from a focal follow or an instantaneous scan, is really useful for telling us how animals are coping with the environment that they are in. We can look to see how behaviour patterns change across the course of the day, across the course of a season or year, as well as with differences in physiological state and when enrichment or husbandry regime is provided within the enclosure. If we have particularly specialised species that have exacting requirements in captivity, for example these colobus monkeys that are folivorous and require a leafy diet, we can ensure that the husbandry provided to the animals is suitable based on measuring their behaviour and therefore inferring their welfare state. The animal behaviour scientist has a real role in understanding zoo animal welfare. We can document the effect of stereotypic or abnormal repetitive behaviours 
watch the stargazing in this giraffe. We can work out the stimulus for that abnormal behaviour, understand how it might be changed with enrichment and provide the animal with better ways of coping. In the case of the giraffe we've just seen stargazing, his behaviour was in response to a female in the group being in season and was caused by his frustration at her lack of enjoyment of his attention. But stargazing is an example of a negative welfare indicator, so it should be investigated further. We can perform event sampling of the number of times such an event occurred, and we can correlate that with ongoing environmental or social variables. What we want our giraffe to be doing is relaxed chewing the cud that we can see in this individual here. Rumination is a key positive welfare indicator for ruminant herbivores and again is an excellent example of a behaviour that we can time maybe through focal scan or continuous sampling and therefore compare its performance to the variables around the animal at that particular time. And finally, zoo animal research can shed light onto unusual or poorly defined behaviour patterns, such as the case in this unusual directed interaction from one James's flamingo to another. Information on such behaviour is scant in the literature, but observation of zoo house birds can shed more light onto why such social behaviour might occur. And I publish this in conjunction with my then PhD supervisor, Professor Darren Croft, in the open access journal Wildfowl, to provide an example of why zoo-based science and observation of zoo-housed animals can advance the ethological field, explain more about animal behaviour, and show the real usefulness of zoos as a tool for scientific investigation. The examples used in this presentation have been very mammal heavy. Please do not forget the zoo housed reptiles, amphibians, fish and invertebrates too, as well as other birds aside of flamingos. This myriad of species housed in the zoo is one of its research strengths. As I said earlier, the accessibility to the animal, the cross population comparisons that can be done across facilities or even within the same facility enable a wide range of research questions to be answered. Data from the zoo can be directly translated into the wild. We can learn more about how animals interact with their environment, how they have evolved particular traits and consequently how we can underpin key conservation action with the research that we do in captivity. If you'd like any more details on any of the methods noted, specifically those concerning how to create a time activity budget from scan or continuous sampling, I recommend Martin and Bateson's Measuring Behaviour book to you. This book will also outline key examples of how to measure social behaviour as well as event behaviours too. Do check the literature and look at papers in Zoo Biology, the Journal of Zoo and Aquarium Research, as well as Applied Animal Behaviour Science, Behavioural Processes and Ethology. These journals contain papers that will cover some other aspects of zoo animal research. For example, behavioural diversity indices, measurement of environmental enrichment and how we conduct space use evaluation too. BIASA, the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquarium, has a research committee of which I am currently the Vice Chair. And Biasa's research committee has produced a handbook of zoo and aquarium research. This is free to download for anyone and contains a range of chapters that relate to answering particular questions using zoo animals. This book is free to download from the research section of the Biasa website. I hope this short presentation has shown you the relevance of zoo animal populations to scientific study. Zoos conduct excellent work 
into education, conservation and research. Their outputs in the world of science are valid, repeatable and useful to a range of both pure and applied scientists.